Hi, my name is Marek Zmysłowski, and I'm here to tell you about a night, a specific night in my life that changed my life forever. It was January 14th, 2018, and that day was, was the best and the worst day of my life at once. On that day, I have met my lifetime hero, and the love of my life told me about love. Just so you are sure, my love of my life is the woman on the left. And the guy in the middle is my lifetime hero. Uh, together with the love of my life, we went to the airport. She was flying in her direction. I was flying in my direction. Um, she told me she loves me. Her eyes started sweating. My eyes started sweating. She boarded the plane, and off she went. And I went to board my plane. My eyes were sweating still. A couple hours later, this is the last picture I was able to make. In a room that was the size of six square meters, where there was no window and there were no doorknobs. I was informed at the airport in Poland that I am wanted by the Nigerian government for so-called high-scale financial fraud. And in Nigeria, the law is very strict. You go to jail from seven to 21 years for financial fraud like this. And I was informed that I have to spend the night in that room and the next day, most probably, I will be transported to Nigeria. At that time, I had no thoughts about being able to survive 21 years in Nigerian jail. And during that night, between prayers, trying to meditate, trying to breathe, losing my breath, walking in circles, praying to all the gods I could think of, trying to find a plan how to get out of it, I promised myself, I sworn to myself that somehow I will get out of it alive and well, and if I do it, when I do it, I will share the story with the rest of the world. But let's start from the beginning. It was 2012, and I was a very young and hungry for international business adventure entrepreneur. At that time, I met a company called Rocket Internet, which happens to be one of the best online companies in the world, and they had a very ambitious plan to so-called conquer the business online space in Africa. And I, I was in the launching, in the founding team of managers sent to Europe, sent from Europe to Africa. We started in Nigeria to launch different e-commerce ventures. Copycats of Amazon, companies like eBay, companies like Booking.com that were not in that region yet. And we were the ones supposed to, supposed to do it. And at that time, I got to be honest with you, my knowledge of Africa was close to zero. I knew that there's Savannah. There, are, there were a lot of TV advertisements of kids with big bellies being very hungry. I knew that there's a huge wealth inequality in Africa and, of course, corruption. But I didn't really care because someone sent me there. And if I make a mistake, it was that big company's mistake. I just wanted to have an international adventure because all I could see throughout all my life was MTV, movie clips, Hollywood movies, and stories of millionaires from Silicon Valley. But my Africa turned out to be something very different. My Africa turned out to be airports, big cities, huge agglomerations with uh, public transportation and, and business, and a lot of business. I was extremely lucky to be a part of a story of a group of companies called Jumia that ended up becoming a public listed company on the New York Stock Exchange. And I've also realized that more and more People from Europe, like myself, young entrepreneurs, young business people, or just students, or whoever, who were always bombarded with those negative things about Africa, started coming to me and asking me about the other part of Africa that I kind of represented. And back then, maybe in a naive way, I thought that I should, talk fo I should focus on the good stuff about Africa, because too many people say too many bad stuff about Africa. Too many non-government organizations say bad stuff about Africa because it helps them raise a lot of money. But at the same time, it scares the investors, the business people, that may or may not do business with Africa, not extract Africa. And maybe naively, I've believed in this so-called self-fulfilling prophecy, that if I talk good stuff about Africa intensively enough, I will bring attention of the good people that will come to Africa, do business with Africa, because Africa doesn't need your help, but it sure does want to make business with you, then that good PR becomes a good reality. But at, once, at one side, I was trying to fight with some part of stereotypes, but on the other hand, 
I've become a victim. Not sure if victim is the right word, but I believed the other stereotypes. One of the stereotypes tells you that if you open a company from scratch on your own in Nigeria, for example, you want to do it with a local strong partner. Give him some shares, uh, uh, invite him to your management board, because when things go rough, when the bad people go against you, the godfather will protect you. What people don't tell you is that sometimes the godfather goes against you. Because sometimes the godfather thinks that he doesn't need you anymore to run this company. And unfortunately, that happened to me. And I'm not saying that I'm the victim here. At that point, I was a very confident, aggressive CEO that always knew what he wants to do. And I always thought that I'm right. And it's not easy when two people with big egos compete about which decision, which opinion in the way the company is run is better. The godfather tried to take over the company. I decided to fight back. All the other uh, people from the management board and all the other investors stood by me. And we were able to make the godfather retaliate. And we fired everyone that was working with him. And obviously, we didn't want to continue the business with the godfather anymore. So we offered him a fair cash out. The godfather said, I will sell my shares to you, but I want twice as much as you are offering me. We told him we will never pay you twice as much, but let's talk and let's negotiate. Then the godfather went silent until January 14th, 2018, when at the Okenche airport, I found out that the Interpol, which is the global police, issued an arrest warrant after me, considered me as an international fugitive on the run. When Nigeria found out that I am in Poland at that time, they've issued an extradition request saying that I need to be sent to Nigeria immediately to stand the trial. All my bank accounts in Nigeria were frozen. The police raided my house, raided my office, and collected everything they could find there. Everything absolutely without any evidence to support their claims. I was extremely lucky again, because the Polish prosecutor, the next night after I spent that night in jail I told you about, when he noticed and he saw the documentation, he said that this is not enough to send me to Nigeria. And he let me go, although he told me that technically I'm in a home arrest because I can't leave Poland until these things get solved. At that stage, I had no clue how to so-called solve this case. Until a phone call rang, a phone rang, and someone from Nigeria that told me he's a legal representative, he told me that he knows a way to make all those arrest warrants and all those extradition requests disappear. Funny enough, the amount of money I was supposed to pay him to make the whole thing disappear was exactly the missing amount that the godfather wanted from me. And that's where I realized that I need to find a different way to fight it, even if it's going to cost me more money. And we started fighting it. We hired the best lawyer in Nigeria I could afford that went to the police station that sent this arrest warrant after me and got kicked out. My Nigerian lawyer went to the court that issued the extradition request request and got kicked out. So we took Nigerian police to court. In the international sector, we had to appeal to the Interpol headquarters in France. Because Interpol, when a country wants, wants you in their country, when they issue an arrest warrant, they can put this arrest warrant to the Interpol network without being checked at all. Interpol only checks it after you appeal, after you're able to appeal, because you're outside jail, after you're able to afford a lawyer to appeal. At the same time, the, ministry, the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Amnesty International uh, Organization, the Open Dialogue Foundation have sent numerous letters to the Nigerian Ministry of Justice and Nigerian Ministry of Foreign Affairs to explain us why am I wanted and where is the evidence that supports the claim. They never replied. We happened to be the luckiest people on, in the world again, because after a couple of months, the Nigerian federal court in Abuja said that the police actions in Nigeria against me are unconstitutional, unlawful, and they even uh, awarded me with $10,000, which is two million naira, more or less, local currency uh, price, or not really price, but the reward to cover the damages. Until today, I wasn't able to find a way for the Nigerian police to pay me that money. So if you know a way, please give me a call. What's interesting here is that it took me three months 
to become the first, and I really hope the last foreigner to ever take Nigerian police to court and win, but it took more than a year to win the case in so-called civilized first world country of France until Interpol finally admitted that they have also made a mistake by allowing this strange arrest warrant to become a part of the global international network. So that's a funny thing about stereotypes, right? It took me three, man three months and a lot of people in Nigeria that were willing to help and the efficiency of the Nigerian justice system to find this case in way more than a year. And what's funny also enough that the godfather was represented by a Nigerian company. Those were entrepreneurs that spent their whole life in Nigeria doing business, but they were not Nigerians because people told me don't do business in Nigeria. So the godfather had actually an Indian passport and the CFO that was working with him against me had an American passport. And the people that helped me were Nigerians. You know, when you make a lot of stupid decisions in life, but you're extremely lucky, you have an interesting life. If you're not lucky, you're dead. But if you're lucky and you make stupid decisions, you have an interesting life. So all these stories and many others from my business life, I've put into a book that in Poland, Polish is called Gonion Czarna Jednorożce, and in, in England, in, in the States, and in all the English-speaking countries, it's called Chasing Black Unicorns. I decided to publish this book and to focus the whole revenue from this book, 100% of it, to put it into a foundation that I, together with the love of my life, have founded, called Maya, that is supposed to do a little bit of good stuff in Africa as well. I do know and I do believe that NGOs, when they become too big, are not too good. But a small, effective NGO can do a lot of change. I consider myself as one of the luckiest guys in the world. You already know a couple of stories where I was so extremely lucky. But most importantly, I was born in Poland. My parents had enough money to put me to school, studies, which I then left after a couple of months, but that's another story. And they've paid for my English speaking uh, lessons, so I know how to speak English, and then I was able to do my work. But there are people that, are, that have way less luck in life. For example, girls and kids in Maiduguri, in Borno State in Nigeria. When you are a girl living in a tribalistic environment with a religion that, let's just put it mildly, does not promote women as the most powerful position in the society, when you live in a village where historically, in the last couple of years, the terrorists have kidnapped more than 300 girls and turned them into slaves, I think it's fair to say that they are not the most luckiest people on the planet. So we figured out a way of scholarships to, that we can give to the smartest girls from school that are good at maths or physics, bring them to a bigger city, give them enough education so they can become accountants or web developers, and once they stand on their feet, once they become part of middle class, once they start making money, then they can use 10% of their salary and send it back to the foundation and then help another two girls. Let's go back to, to the night that changed my life forever. In the beginning, I was really driven by revenge, by trying to clear my name, by trying to prove the other side that this is not good what they did. I was talking to them, I, I worked with the police, they put me all these undercover microphones, I was going to meetings to collect evidence against them, so maybe this time I can put them to jail for what they did to me, but this time it would happen the legal, civilized way. But then I've realized that instead of being driven by revenge, I should thank those people that put me in that situation, because I had to really get my shit together in order to fight it. For more than a year and a half, I wasn't able to leave Poland. For some people, that's not a bad thing, but all my business for the last six years was based outside Poland, outside Europe. 100% of my business life, professional life, was in Africa. So I was, I was cut out of my financial resources overnight. At the same time, having a lawyer in the US, France, Nigeria, and Poland, is not a cheap thing. So I had to be really laser focused to deal with the situation. And I've realized after a couple months, when I won this all, that right now I am happier than I ever was because I really focused only on the good stuff. So instead of being driven by revenge, I should thank them because they made me a better person, a stronger person, a happier person. 
And that is my story. Thank you very much for your attention.